May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, o God our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. On this fourth and last Sunday of the Advent season, we are always treated to a gospel narrative related to the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this year, it is the turn of the Annunciation narrative in St. Luke's Gospel. Hence, you have an Annunciation created by El Greco, Dominicos Theotokopoulos, uh, simply nicknamed El Greco by the Spanish because and who can blame them? They couldn't get their tongues around Domenicos Theotokopoulos. El Greco made quite a number of uh, images of the Annunciation. He made three attempts at a final uh, piece, and there are three separate individual canvases scattered around the world. This is one of the lesser known of those canvases, and this one is from the Museum of Fine Arts in Budapest. I did preach at 8 a.m. this morning, a rather long and, I must say, somewhat dull sermon about the art history of this canvas. So I'm going to take a slightly different ta tack at this sermon and turn my notes over and try and preach from memory on just a few salient points that I would like to raise from this Annunciation. The Annunciation, of course, is that moment that we've just heard in the Gospel when the mighty Archangel Gabriel meets with the Virgin Mary and he tells her, Hail, O highly favored of the Lord, the Lord is with thee, and then announces that the Holy Ghost will miraculously conceive in her virgin womb a son, and he shall be holy to the Lord. He shall be known as the Son of God. If you look at the picture, you will notice that Gabriel, the archangel, holds his right hand in a slightly unusual gesture. This is because El Greco does not simply uh, draw on the Western Renaissance painters of Rome and Venice and uh, uh, Italy, but in fact he originates from Crete, hence the name El Greco, the Greek. And what he does is he commingles, he mixes the ancient iconography of the Byzantine school in which he was raised which has a thousand years of history behind it, just like the icon of Our Lady of Perpetual Pity and Mercy that is to your left at the front of the church. That iconography is of a school all of its own. It's very particular. It's very distinct. The symbolism, the iconography, is highly stylized. The gold that you often see in the back of uh, the background of icons is not just there because it looks pretty. It's there because it denotes to us that this is the kingdom of heaven. This is the background to the saint, the virgin, the Christ, the archangel at whom we are looking. El Greco draws that in and has the archangel make that sign, if I can just get it right, that ancient sign, and any of you who have ever been to an Eastern Orthodox liturgy will know jolly well that this is the sign of blessing. And this goes back almost 2,000 years. 
the Orthodox still use it today. And does anyone have any guess as to what this symbolizes? No, it's, it, uh, sorry, sorry uh, to disappoint you. It's not the Trinity. It's actually the name Jesus. Okay, so if you turn it this way, there is the initial letter, iota, uh, I. The second letter is eta, E. There is a sigma, and there is an, uh, uh, what's U in Greek? I can't remember. Upsilon. There is an upsilon, and there is also another sigma. Yesaus. That is the sign and symbol for the name of Jesus. So the archangel greets the virgin with the name. The archangel is so powerful as the messenger of God Almighty. His voice is so fertile as, do you remember when the Virgin Mary met Elizabeth? The child in Elizabeth's womb leapt at the greeting. It's as if the infant Christ in the Virgin Mary's womb is so fertile, so fecund, that even at the words of his mother, which enter the ears of St. Elizabeth, Saint Elizabeth, her cousin, that the child in her womb leaps for joy, John the Baptist. The word of God is so powerful, the utterance of God is so powerful, the symbol of Jesus is so powerful that Mary conceives in her womb. The Holy Spirit, and you can trace his descent from the very top of the picture, and there, there's almost like a lightning uh, bolt coming down to the dove. And of course the dove has his or her wings stretched out, so they form the sign of a cross. In his left hand, the mighty archangel Gabriel holds the lilies, the fertile, fresh, almost dew-soaked lilies, which are a sign of fertility, virginity, and also the coming presence of the Christ child. In very marked contrast to the dried flowers and grasses that are in that vase, and we'll come back to that vase in just a moment. This is unusual because, of course, very often in depictions of the Annunciation, we are used to seeing a teenage maiden, a very young girl being met by the archangel. This is not a teenage maiden. This is actually a lady, a woman, of some standing and of some years. She is dressed in very up-to-date, fashionable Spanish costume. She wears, and I do like it when uh, people like Ayoko and, and certain other members of the congregation, not the men, of course, the women, I mean, wear mantilla. They're, they're rather splendid, I think, and uh, please don't ever feel ashamed, as long as you're a lady, uh, to wear a mantilla to church. She is draped in this gorgeous lace Spanish mantilla around her head and draping around her shoulders. <coughs> With her left hand, she firmly places her hand on a particular page in the book she has been reading. And you know when you open a book and the pages fly everywhere, she's stopped them. She's actually kind of made a, a, a full stop here. She's paused 
and the pages can't spin over anymore. You can see the ones fluttering uh, on her right side, but the, the ones on her left side are stationary. Legend has it, of course, and this is a symbol of that legend, that all the cosmos paused in that moment when the archangel and the virgin meet. And all of heaven and God himself and the nine choirs of angels and all the prophets and all the holy people and all creation pause and remain still waiting for the response of the virgin to God's call. With her right hand, she greets the archangel. She acknowledges his presence, and she gazes up at him as he gazes down at her. The predominant color in this picture is glacial blue. That's very unusual. If you look at the other uh, El Greco an annunciations, you'll see blues, obviously. But blue is the predominating color here. And in what place is the Virgin normally located at the Annunciation? Um, she's normally in a library or a study, stuffed full of leather-bound books and first editions and voluminous works that she is perusing and reading. Here, that study has been kind of done away with. What El Greco does is he, rather unusually, portrays the whole cosmos in this tiny space. That's the blue, the glacial blue, of the heavens and the earth and outer space and the oceans. And it's the same kind of blue that the archangel kneels upon. There are very, very few right angles in this picture. The one that I had spotted is the prayer desk at which the Virgin sits, but everything else is much more malleable, much more uh, movable. Then there are those tiny intricacies. At her feet lies a half-finished work. This is a work in progress. It's a, a shawl or maybe another mantilla. Uh, it's some kind of garment. And it's only halfway through. And it's resting there at her feet with that tiny pair of scissors. Can you see the scissors? absolutely beautifully just kind of dropped in as a, an afterthought. Now back to the vase, the highly polished vase, and I've dropped my glasses just a second. I need my glasses, and I can't see you, but I can see the picture, and also I need a magnifying glass, so I suggest you use a magnifying glass and your glasses, if not a microscope, when you get home. And if you look very carefully at that highly polished vase, any guesses at what you can see? The, it's kind of divided into two halves. What can you see on the left side? And it's a very faint outline. It is a person. Actually, it's two people. And uh, if you look carefully enough and you pay attention, you pay heed, you are patient enough, you will very quickly discern that it is an Eastern Orthodox icon very similar to our icon here on your left, 
of the Blessed Virgin holding the Christ child. So it's as if time has been concentrated into this moment when in the vase a premonition of the future is held before us. At the greeting of the angel, Mary answers, yes. This very instant is the one that we recall at every Angelus. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. In this season, as we approach Christmas and the birth of God himself in the mysterious Logos, the Word made flesh, what will your response be to that greeting? What will that word mean to you? The Eastern Orthodox don't believe that you just ponder on an icon, on a work of art. Eastern Orthodoxy teaches that the word icon, which is quite literally mirror or window or looking glass, is actually a glimpse from this earthly realm into none other than heaven itself, the divine, the eternal. The Orthodox treat icons so respectfully that they approach them with great honor, with great dignity, because they know it's not just them gazing upon the icon, but the icon and the divine, and heaven, and eternity, are gazing out at us. The icon embraces us. This takes a lot of time. This takes a lot of patience. It won't go down very well with our, race cult uh, our, our, our racing along culture. You need to stop. You need to pause. You need to think and meditate and pray. And then the miracle of not only you gazing upon the divine, but the divine gazing upon you will become a reality. In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.